Good morning everyone and praise the Lord. It's an honor to be here again today to share the word of God with you. Uh, in this season uh, when uh, there are many things happening around us, but I just want to welcome you this last Sunday of March 2020. And um, just to, for those who may be joining us for the first time, uh, most of our brethren that join us online, the theme for this quarter has been hold firmly onto Christ. And um, the first three months, we have been laying the basis of our confidence. Why do we need to be confident and hold firmly onto Jesus Christ? So that has been um, our emphasis. And to bring this to a close, today's topic to emphasize uh, on uh, the basis of our foundation. Today's topic is the unchanging nature of God. The unchanging nature of God is one of the key reasons we have a confidence in Christ. Because as I've already said, with the scare and the fear caused by COVID-19, it is possible to soldier through this season with a lot of confidence in God, because we have a God who is with us. Um, I want to say that even as we come to uh, read the scripture, that maybe before I even read, I want to say we have a God who cares for us. As I connect with this theme, I'm reminded of what we shared on the first Sunday of 2020, on 5th of January. And I thought maybe I need to recap a few things that we talked about as a way of just bring us to speed on how much God bothered to prepare us, even for coronavirus and other experiences of this nature that may come along. And I, and I just want to pick a few things that we talked about just as a way of reminding us uh, about some of the things. We were trying to answer the question, why hold family onto Christ? And as in response to that, we talked about a couple of verses that God put in our hearts concerning this year. He reminded us that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. This confession was made by Thomas in John 20 and verse 28. And uh, Thomas, when he met the resurrected Christ, he got a revelation that although he had followed Jesus thinking that this is another good charismatic leader, actually Jesus was Lord and God. Jesus himself in um, Revelation 1 verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. And we were saying as we go through the year 2020, brethren, let's remember there is the one who knows the beginning and the ending. He knows the details. It is important for us to be reminded of that fact. I want to remind us also, we looked at... Um, Colossians 1 and verse, uh, verse 15 tell us that God allowed the fullness, his fullness to dwell in his son, Jesus Christ. And verse 16 says, through him all things were created, both things on earth and things in heaven. Nothing was made without him. And verse 17 tells us that in him all things hold together. And I remember clearly the Lord was reminding us that as we go through the year 2020, our God is able to hold all things together. When COVID-19 is causing things to fall apart, the whole world is in panic. I'm saying there is one who can hold all things together, and that is why it is important for us to put our confidence in him. It is good also to remind us because the, the, the pandemic has come with a lot of death. And you know, when Peter was responding to people who were wondering, how could you cause a healing on a cripple? In the book of Acts, chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter tells the people that this man Jesus that you killed, he is the author of life. Praise God. It is good for us, friends, to remind ourselves that life is an author. And when the scale is all over and people are worried about their life, I want to tell you that we are calling every believer to hold firmly on the author of life. He is not just an author of life who authors lives in us and leaves us. You know, uh, in Matthew 1, when the angel was talking to Joseph, 
I remember the conversation. The angel tells Joseph, don't run away from Mary, you know. The baby carried in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And when the boy is born, you will give him the name Jesus because he will be the savior of the world. Jesus offers life in us, but he follows us up to save us when we have lost the way. So as we call ourselves to hold on to Christ, again we are saying, we are calling you to Hold on to the author of life who also follows us up to save us. And in verse 23 of the same Matthew chapter 1, he tells Joseph that he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. That this author of life follows us up when we have missed the way to save us and then comes along with us because he is God with us. Hallelujah. It is important for us to be reminded in this kind of a season when we are going through difficult times, friends, that the author of life who also walks with us to guide us, to intercede for us as the scripture tells us, it is important for us to be reminded of these facts. And you know, even as he walks with us, the scripture gains us a lot of um, reference that tells us what Jesus does with us. As he walks with us, in Mark 12, verse 10, the Bible tells me that he is the pillar of both life and salvation. Jesus Christ, he is not only a savior, but he is the pillar on which life and salvation stands. Hallelujah. He is able to walk with us. He is able to uphold us. He is able to preserve us. He is able to uphold us. Why is he able to do this? In Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus commissioning his disciples says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Hallelujah. We are calling you to hold on to him who has all authority in heaven and earth. He is able to handle the situations that we meet. He is able to deal with every circumstance that comes our way because he has authority. And finally, let me say, one of the, the other things that we reminded ourselves uh, uh, that we, we talked about is the fact that Jesus has actually been given the mandate to judge the world. He is the judge of both the living and the dead. According to uh, Acts 10 and verse 42, the Bible is very clear that he has been appointed by God to judge both the living and the dead. So, even as we go through the circumstances that we are going through, in case things get tough, one has authority, but even in the final end, if we hold on to him, we are holding on to him who will make the final judgment in the last day. So, we are safe, friends. I want to tell you that we are safe and we can continue trusting in him and holding firmly in him. But you know, somebody may say, maybe that was a Jesus then. Hello? You know, I know sometimes we get challenged. Maybe those days when he walked on earth. Our theme for the year is drawn from Hebrews. And Hebrews 13 verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. He remains the same. He does not change. And so as we ask everyone to hold on to Christ, it's because he does not change. His authority remains. Yes, it doesn't come to an end. And we'll be talking a little more about that. So as we talk about the unchanging nature of God, we already get an introduction from this verse. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, we can trust him to walk with us along the journey. Let me therefore just uh, read a bit from Hebrews 6 verse 17 to 18, which is our key text today. And this is what the Bible says. Hebrews 6 verse 17 uh, down to 19. I'll read just uh, part of that. And the Bible says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear, to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, 
we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And the verse continues. When I look at this passage very briefly now, uh, just to pick three key things that pop up from this passage that I want to talk about and we will be done. One, this passage, I like the fact that God does not change. Um, secondly, it uh, brings out the fact that God, God's purpose do not change. And also, as he says he took an oath about a promise, it also assures us that God's promises do not change. Let me start with the first one, that God does not change. Friends, the Bible speaks beside this verse. The Bible is very clear about who our God is. And let me just pick a few moments where God has introduced himself in uh, Exodus 3, verse 14, God was introducing himself to Moses and he said, when they ask you who has sent you, tell them, I am has sent you. I am who I am. Praise the Lord. <laughs> God has no beginning and no ending. He always is. Praise the Lord. I am means he is present today. He was present at the beginning and he will be present at the end. He does not change. He always is. Why is he like that? You know, Jesus again uh, yeah, introducing himself uh, to really introducing God to the Samaritan woman in John 4 verse 24. Jesus told this woman God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in truth and spirit. Friends, it is important for us to know that a spirit does not die. A spirit lives forever. That is why the Bible talks of people spending eternity in hell or eternity with God in heaven. Because we also, God has deposited in every one of us a deposit of a spirit and the spirit lives eternally. And because God is a spirit, God never dies. He doesn't have a body like our physical body that die. But even us, when we die, our spirits will be judged. That's why God has appointed Christ as a judge. So God is eternal. And this God, I've said the first thing, God does not change. In Malachi 3 and verse uh, 6, the Bible says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, all sons of Jacob, are not destroyed. Hallelujah. The fact that God lives eternally is the reason that those that he had given a promise, generations later, hallelujah, to just remember that when the promise was given, is many years back, but because God does not change, he remains. Those that were given a promise continue to enjoy the benefit of that promise. I want to say this was in the circumstance where the Israelites would commit a lot of sin before God. They would turn to other gods and worship them. But because God does not change, they were not destroyed. Can I say in this season, of COVID-19 in 2020 and for the family of believers. It is important for us to know that we have a promise from God. Hallelujah. A promise that he who has promised does not change. And because of that, his promise can remain. David understand, understanding that uh, cites in Psalms uh, 90 and verse 2 that before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world because from everlasting to everlasting you are God. From everlasting to everlasting our God does not change. He remains. 
The same psalmist in Psalms 102, verse 25 to 27. The Bible talks about how God founded the earth and the heavens from the beginning. It talks of how he changes the earth and how he changes the heavens and the elements that made them. But verse 27 goes on to say, but you remain unchanged. Hallelujah. Our God does not change. And when we say the basis of our confidence it's due to the fact that our God, his nature, his character does not change. Maybe I need to mention a few things about the character of God. You know, the Bible tells us that when Jesus, again, uh, sorry, before we come to Jesus, uh, maybe, yes, let me refer to the prophecy about Jesus given in Daniel 7 and verse 14. And in Daniel 7 verse 14, um, the Bible talks of he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power over all people, nations, and powers. All the peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Hallelujah. That is the kind of a king we are asking you to put your hands on. That we hold on to him whose dominion will never come to an end. His kingdom cannot be destroyed. He is not competing with the sicknesses and with the pandemic. He is eternal. He is all powerful. His character is also part of his nature that does not change. You know, the Bible tells us in Exodus 34, when God again was giving us more details when Moses and he requested, God, show me your glory. And God puts Moses in a cleft of a rock. And then he passes before him. And he, declare, he proclaimed, the Bible says, and God proclaimed himself and said that he is God. Compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Our God is a compassionate God. His character of compassion and faithfulness abounds forever. But this same God is also a righteous and a just God. It's important for us to know that when we talk about God being a righteous and a just God, it means he will deal with wickedness. And so as we relate with him, he is a gracious and a compassionate God to those who humble themselves before him, but he will exercise justice to those who take him for granted. That's why we call everyone to turn to him, not to give excuses. When we fail, we will be judged because he is a righteous judge. We already talked about him, uh, Christ being the judge of the world. But it's important to say that God is not just looking for opportunity to judge us. As a matter of fact, in Psalms 103, um, the Bible is very clear uh, from verse 8 there. He will not always accuse. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, you know. He is a merciful God. He does not even treat us according to our iniquities. Friends, our God is a merciful God. It's said in Psalms um, uh, 102 also that as... Um, um, explains to us that this God also he is very gracious because he does not condemn us he does not want to judge us according to our sins he wants to be patient with us and he takes us he handles us very graciously and uh, just to remind us that our God we can hold on to him praise God we can hold on to him we can put our trust in him. He is reliable. There's a prophet who, who understood the character of God. His name is Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2, Jonah uh, puts it very interestingly. You know, he is complaining to God when God declined to destroy Nineveh. We said our God has a character that is consistent as part of his nature. That gives us confidence. And what did Jonah say in 4 verse 2? 
He tells God, God, I know you are a compassionate and a gracious God. Slow to, to anger and abounding in love. That is, this is what I said when I was still in my country. And that is why I ran away to Tashish. You know, you read that verse and you see this man. He says, I knew you are a merciful God who relents and does not want to bring calamity. All that content, you find it there in that verse too. You know, the prophet had known who God is. That he does not change. Even a pagan turning to God today, they will find mercy, they will find grace. Hallelujah. So every one of us is welcome to turn and put our confidence in this Jesus who is merciful, his grace abounds always. He does not change. His character is consistent. He does not change. And I'm inviting us, friends, to put our confidence in this God. But we said God does not change in his nature, in his character. He does not change. But the second thing that um, uh, Hebrews 6 and verse 17 highlighted to us is that God's unchanging, the unchanging nature of God's purpose is part of the basis of our confidence. What is this nature or what is this purpose of God? As we talk about the character and the nature of God being constant, it does not change. What is this unchanging nature of God's purpose? What is God's purpose for mankind? You know, this is not far-fetched. It is drawn from the vision God had before God created mankind. In Genesis 1 verse 28, uh, verse 26, that was the vision. Man was not created then in Genesis 1 26. And God says, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness, and let him rule. In other words, God did not just create us without a purpose, without an intention. The intention of God was to create a mankind that he can bless with authority, with privileges. Basically, verse 28 tells us, after creating man, verse 27, verse 28, the Bible says, and God blessed them. Man and woman, what did God do to them? The first thing that God did after creating mankind, God blessed them. I want to say the purpose of God for mankind was that man may enjoy God's blessing. Hallelujah. It said first Peter, um, oh no, it's James. James 1 and verse 17. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights. Who does not change like shifting shadows? Our God is unchanging character is mentioned here. And we are told this unchanging character of God is why man continues to receive good and perfect gifts. The purpose of God was that we may walk in his favor, in his blessings. We may enjoy his goodness. That was the purpose of God from the beginning. And that purpose has never changed. I want to say, friends, as we go through these seasons, people may have their own views about God. I don't know what fears people have. Some are getting discouraged and thinking that God has abandoned us. But the Bible says the reason good and perfect gifts continue pouring out unto men is because God does not change. He does not change like shifting shadows. He is consistent. He is reliable. He is a God we can put our confidence in. He created us that we may enjoy his blessing. And the first thing he did after creating mankind, as the Bible makes it very clear, is to bless mankind. And I want to say this purpose has been enshrined in the word of God. And the word of God does not change. He says clear in Psalms 119 and verse 89 that your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It is firmly settled in heaven. The word of God is settled. God's purpose that are enshrined in his word 
They do not change. He, you know, even uh, Solomon in Proverbs 19 verse 21, he says, you know, man may have many plans, but God's purpose prevails. In other words, the purpose of God has been set that whoever will put their faith in him, they will enjoy his blessings and his goodness. And because God put his image in us, the image of God includes the freedom to choose. Those who choose not to accept the grace and the goodness of God will also get what that choice requires them to get. So this purpose has been securely set. The word of God will not change. You know, Isaiah 40 and verse 8, the Bible says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. It does not change. That is why when Job was debating with God and uh, battling, after God asked him a few questions in Job 42 verse 2, this man said, your plans cannot be thwarted. I know, God, you can do all things and that your plans cannot be thwarted. God has a plan. God has a purpose for us. And that purpose is consistent. It is reliable. It is that which gives us the confidence to hold firmly onto him. That is the basis of our confidence. And lastly, let me say that God's promises also do not change. Hallelujah. You know, taking you back to the verse we read in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Hebrews 6. God has given us a promise. You know, and those promises are anchored in God's unchanging nature. And those promises of God do not change. That is why in Malachi 3, 6, I already referred to that. It says that I, God, do not change. So you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. But maybe the best we can draw as we talk about this, uh, keeping of promise of God. Numbers 23, uh, and verse 18, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? You know, whenever God gives a promise, he follows his promises to fulfill. That is why, friends, if you know, um, it said First Kings 8 and verse 56. This man called uh, Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple, the man Solomon says, praise be to the Lord who gives rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Now listen to the next sentence. And it says, not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. Hallelujah. That when God gives a promise, it may take forever to come, but the promises of God shall come true. I am saying this is the basis of our confidence. We have a God who promises and keeps his promises to the end. He does not disappoint his people. And as we go through the seasons we are going through, I am calling upon the people of God. Our anchor is God. We have a reliable solution. Our key verse in Hebrew says, the reason God made that promise and even made a vow. How can God take an oath? Verse 18, the Bible says, it is because we who have fled to take hold of him should be greatly encouraged. Friends, it's not just some encouragement, but the Bible says great encouragement. Hebrews 6 verse 18. And so that we may be greatly encouraged. And verse 19 says, and that faith then in him, the hope we have, may be firm and secure in him. Friends, the promises of God do not change. We can put our confidence in him. He is reliable. I want to speak to someone here today who may be wondering, I'm not a believer. How do I benefit and run away from the fear and the scare that this uh, coronavirus has brought? I want to say the Bible gives 
a promise. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, God is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God is willing to forgive and cleanse us so that anyone who is willing can come. And like verse, uh, verse 18 of uh, Hebrews 6 says, we can also come and take hold of the hope that is there in him. We can come. And when the situations are getting out of hand, the word of God continued to affirm and make it very clear. Jesus talking to his disciples uh, before his crucifixion says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, there will be many troubles. Yes. But what does he tell them? But take heart. I have overcome. Yes. He has overcome. The Bible is very clear. In John 14, 19, it says, Because I live, you also shall live. Hallelujah. So we can come and take hold on, of Christ, who has assured us that he is walking with us this journey. He will take us through. Nothing will mess us up. In Colossians 3, verse 3, the Bible says, Our lives are hidden in Christ. We have already died. Yes? Galatians says the same in Galatians 2 verse 20. That I have uh, been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives through me. So if our life is hidden with Christ, whose kingdom shall never be destroyed, whose dominion reigns forever, then as children of God, we can rest assured that we have a God who is working with us and who will continue to settle our lives. I want to say, May God save us from calamity. But I want to say, in case any of us becomes a victim of this sickness, our God is able to heal us. Amen. Our God is able to heal. And in case he allows that this tent rests, the Bible says those who die in the Lord rest from their toils. The Lord rests them. Your case is still safe because the judge who finally determines where your soul and your spirit will take rest is the one you are holding on to and he is gracious and merciful to those whose hope has been put in him. So I want us to put our confidence in God and our trust, our boldness, our courage to be anchored in him and we rest assured that our God is faithful. I want us to pray. And as we pray, in case you have never put your faith in God, wherever you are in this globe, I know there are many people watching us across. Last week I got a presentation from some people from Nigeria saying, thank you for the sermon. And I'm saying, let us put our confidence in God, who is able to secure our welfare in life and in death. We have been assured he is the author of life. He is the sustainer of life. In him all things hold together. I want us to pray to him who holds all our things together. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you chose to give this world that we may be greater and courage, but even more so that our souls may find an anchor in the hope that we have in you. And today I pray for the people of God, wherever they are across the globe, oh God, may you remember your people, Jehovah. May you secure your children, Father, I pray. I pray that you may continue to be merciful. Anyone that is turning to you this morning and is seeking that you may save their lives from death and from hell, Father, may you save them. May you deliver them, O oh God. May you turn them to yourself. I pray for everyone who is putting their hope and their faith in you for protection. May you be that shelter, O oh God, under whom they find refuge and they be safe, O oh God. I pray for your people when we are going through this um, uh, curfew, Lord, and, and the businesses are suffering. I pray may you be the hiding place where people will find supplies and those that are in need will be well taken care of. Father, I pray that your people will be able to access help. 
I intercede for those who are already suffering because they work on contracts that are paid daily and their work has already stopped. May you be gracious and merciful. May you give ideas and wisdom, O oh God, and how your people can live and pass through this season, O oh God. We pray for welfare. We pray for protection. And above it all, O oh God, we continue to pray for our country. May you grant us welfare. May you stop this scourge, O oh God. May it not proceed any further. We even know there is a threat of food shortage because of the locusts. And we continue to pray, Jehovah. Be merciful to our country, O oh Lord. Send your weed, may it drive away the locusts from our land, O oh God. That the remaining food may be spared. And that your people may have something to eat, O oh God. We continue to put our confidence in you. And we put our hope in you. We know that you are a loving and a gracious God. Slow to anger. Even if we have, been, we have committed and sin, O oh God. We, your children, turn to you. And we pray that you may forgive us. And show us mercy, O oh God. We thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We appreciate you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for listening to this message. I pray may this unchanging God uphold you. Until we meet again, bye-bye.